Welcome. My name is Natasha Sherman, and I am your host. I have two guests today. My first guest is Jeffrey Deskovic. He's been with us before. In 1990, Jeff, at the age of 17, was wrongfully convicted of rape and murder, and he spent the next 16 years in prison. He was one of the, quote, lucky ones who was exonerated and released from prison after 16 years. Authorities knew his DNA did not match that of the actual perpetrator, who three years later went on to murder another young woman and mother of two. But rogue police officers, prosecutors, and other law enforcement personnel knowingly and maliciously accused, prosecuted, and eventually secured his conviction. Jeffrey is now in law school, and he started the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice, which is committed to fighting wrongful conviction through raising awareness, seeking legislative changes, exonerating the wrongfully convicted, both in DNA and non-DNA cases, and to the reintegration of exonerees. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me here. Always so warm to, to be interviewed by you. Thank and you. Yes. Thank you. And I'm so proud of you. You know, the fact that you have done what you've done with your life, taken on law school, and not only that, but taken on working for other people who have who are in the situation you were in and making a difference from trying to get them out to trying to reintegrate them. So I'm happy to have you back. Thank you very much. My next guest is Lorenzo Johnson. Lorenzo spent almost 22 years incarcerated for a crime he didn't commit. Wrongfully convicted of a 1995 murder in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, he won release from his life without parole sentence in 2012. After the Third Circuit Federal Court of Appeals ruled there was legally insufficient evidence for his conviction, he remained free for four months, after which the U.S. Supreme Court reinstated the conviction, ordered him back to prison to resume the sentence. His defense was not allowed to file briefs or make oral arguments for his position, and he returned to prison on June 14, 2012. With the support of the Pennsylvania Innocence Project, he continued to fight for his freedom, and on July 11, 2017, he was resentenced and released from prison. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, for most of us, this sounds like a made-for-television story. You know, it's a, we can go ooh and oh and all that and have absolutely no idea what it's like to be convicted of a crime you didn't commit and then put in prison. Like, that's it, done, done deal. So I'm going to start with you because, um, you know, Jeff uh, has shared his story and I invite people to look on my YouTube channel, Natasha Sherman, and uh, there are a couple of interviews with Jeff telling his very compelling story. Uh, but let's talk about you right now. So how old were you when you were convicted, accused of, and 22. convicted. You were 22. And um, I think I actually said that. But um, so you were accused of killing someone. No, I was accused of being there when it took place. Oh, of being there when it took place. Yeah. Okay. And uh, again, you, uh, according to what I read, you, your attorney never interviewed you. This was her first uh, capital Case? I was in the capital case's first murder case. Okay, first murder case. And didn't interview you. And how long did the process take? It pretty much, it took almost two years for me to go to trial, but none of my alibi witnesses was interviewed. None of their witnesses basically was interviewed. It was like shambles. <laughs> so you were just basically, you were accused. It took three, three years to get to trial. And basically, nobody was doing anything for you. Nah. And nobody was, it was just kind of, let's wait for his trial and then send him off to jail. As, as the trial neared, things began to change. And when I say things began to change, it started from the police and it, tri and it trickled its way up, not down, to the prosecution office as far as where misconduct was constantly being in play. Like, you know, for example, me having alibi witnesses, one or two of them, all of a sudden, would change their stories, 
and testify for the prosecution, unbeknownst to me that they had different charges against them that was getting dismissed for a false testimony. So this was starting to take place around me, and I didn't know what was going on. I'm a literate education-wise at the time, a literate to the law at the time. So, you know, I'm wondering, like, okay, when I get to court, everything will come out and I'll be set free. But it just kept going, going, and going. And by the time I got to trial, the motive that was the case was bound over from the preliminary hearing all changed. The whole theory changed once I got to trial. And so they lined up all this kind of false evidence yeah. and they... Uh, kind of coerced uh, your alibis to change their uh, alibi testimony because they were uh, in they front could, of the law and they would have something to lose. In, in this case right here, they couldn't put me on the scene. One person put me on the scene. I was never there. So my alibi witnesses was crucial to me. And the only way they felt, I guess, is they had a chance of a conviction for me is to have people put me on the scene or have people change their testimony that would have helped me. Right. Imagine you're sitting there in court and you think that you have these alibis and all of a sudden you hear them lying. Vanish. It's cold. It's the, it's, in situations like that, wrongful convictions, a lot of us don't go to court to be lawyers, you know, it happens to a certain percentage of us. You know, anybody like Jeff was wrongfully convicted. He's white, I'm black. It predominantly happened in the urban neighborhoods, but it can happen to anybody. We don't prepare ourselves for what's to come. So when they put their, their strategic uh, uh, misconduct in play, you, you, you're you not ready for it. It's like trying to breathe underwater. Like, they got unlimited resources, like, and you don't see it coming. I think that's the biggest thing. You don't see it coming because you can't prepare for it. You not only don't see it coming is if you got an incompetent attorney with you, no disrespect to the to to the public defenders, the court appointed lawyers, because I know some terrific public defenders and court appointed lawyers. But let's put it out there, they're the most underpaid people in the and criminal overworked, justice system. And they and they have a lot of cases. You got cases where that's a capital case where uh uh the Anthony Wright case where his public defender was paid twelve hundred dollars. And this man is fighting for uh, uh he got a death penalty involved in this case, he could get the death penalty. And you mean to tell me that twelve hundred dollars is gonna secure uh representation and adequate funds for investigations and things of that nature? Yeah. These are all elements of wrongful convictions. Yeah. So and and, and it turns out from what I read that um after you were released and then went back, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that, um, you found that there was a lot of withheld information in the police reports. Uh, so as uh, um, someone in the law now, what, what transpired and how did that happen? Yeah, it, it, was, it, was, um, it was discovered through an investigation that happened after Lorenzo went went back to uh, went back to prison that the sole witness that put him at the at the scene actually was an alternative suspect and that that information had been withheld from his attorney and that the motive witness actually had like a familial relationship with the main detective's uh, mother that was also crucial material that had been withheld from Lorenzo's defense team. So. What does it feel like? You're back in prison and you find out that all of this information was withheld from you. Now, I found out about, like, can they give you a case discovery before your trial so you could put a sufficient defense on at trial. But in a lot of wrongful conviction situations, they withhold information that can exonerate you or clear you with the misconduct that we spoke about a minute ago. It was over 200 and some missing pages of my case discovery. Like, it started from page, page, it goes, it started at page nine, I believe. And then it have a couple pages and it jumped 20 pages this way. Then supplements wasn't adding up, page numbers wasn't adding up. So I always knew it was something in there, but they, they never turned it over. And then they told me it didn't exist. And for long periods of time, I represented myself. So they definitely wasn't going to give it to me. So I didn't have the right representation to go after it. 
But when I came, when I was released and I had to return, unfortunately, I had the right support and the support and cast around me that was going to dig hard for this. And they wasn't going to wait to later on for season to get it. They demanded that you turn it over. That's when everything fell in my lap. Basically, what I already knew they had, I didn't know it was going to be a bombshell like this, but I knew it had to be something for them to keep it from me this long because if it was something that I couldn't have used, they would have gave it to me a long time ago. Is it legal to withhold this? No, it's not. There's a law, it's called, it's called you know, Brady from the case, Brady versus Maryland, but they're supposed to turn over all exculpatory material, but they often don't. And the, the gap in the system is that there's no criminal penalties for when the prosecutors do that, and there's no there's no civil penalties either. I mean, they have immunity. Then why have the law? You're right. <laughs> I, I agree with you. You're right. <laughs> but that's why the misconduct is uh, prevalent, because they know that they nothing's going to They can it. get away with it. And to make it even worse, Natasha, is even within the context of a defendant trying to get the uh, wrongful conviction overturned, is not even enough just to show that there was a Brady violation, but then the courts have this additional analysis that they put in. They determine whether or not something has been a, a harmless error. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and, and obviously, if it's harmless, they wouldn't have bothered to right. engage in it right. in the first place. Yeah. So it's like they really stacked the deck against, you know, uh, defendants. Timeliness. So when you first were, uh, and I read somewhere, and I think you wrote because you write a lot of blogs, yes? Or articles? Yeah, very blogs yeah. and articles. For, and on Huffington Post. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I think um, I read somewhere where you said, uh, where some of the old timers, when you came in, told you, suggested that you get your GED and that you study the law. And, and you did that, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, that was really great advice and also great that oh, yeah. you took it. That's why, you know, off camera we spoke, uh, we, sp we spoke earlier and we were talking about, you know, it's not all bad people in prison, but you got some people in prison that you don't want a million miles close to your family. Yeah. These old timers, they, I guess they, they grew to like me because I was consistent about my innocence. So they, you know, they assisted me in little ways. And that's probably like the best information I could ever get behind the walls as far as get my education. I was going to do that regardless, yeah. but the, the force, like the push from them, like get your education and assisted me with the, they, they was assisting me with the law when I was lost because the first book they give you is the uh, Pennsylvania Criminal Rules of Procedures. Now this is a book that probably consists of three to 4,000 pages. Now somebody that's illiterate, <laughs> you put a book this big in front of them, they're looking at you like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, yeah. And it was like, once I started, once I achieved my GED and I enrolled in college classes, you know, my brain opened up to a lot of the words, because a lot of the words and law is Latin, so you know you wouldn't know without a law dictionary. So if you can't use a regular dictionary, how are you gonna use a law dictionary? So uh, things came into play, and as I got educated, my eyes opened to what was what, what took place with me. Yeah, wow, that's really impressive. Um, but so you're in there. Did you actually, when you're in there, believe like I'm never going to get out? Nah, nah, I never, I never adopted that attitude. I always knew I would get out. I just didn't know when. That was my whole thing. You were the same. Yeah, that's a com that's a common characteristic of people who are wrongfully um, convicted. Yeah. And if we would have thought the other way, then yeah. ninety five percent of the time we, we would never reemerge. Right, right. You have people that's innocent that went that route, you know. Because like I said, you it's like trying to breathe underwater. It's like a lot of people bust under that pressure of inside and they stop fighting and they yeah. give up and they conform to prison life. Yeah. And you would never think that, you know, they was innocent, but they gave up. They don't want to fight no yeah. more. And you know, I think the fact that you engaged and you got educated and, and you were proactive, but there are a lot of people who are on death row. Uh, I interviewed a, a criminal attorney from California and he said there are, I think, 747 inmates waiting on death row, most of them people of color, all of them poor. So if you're in prison and you, you're innocent and you're not educated mm -hmm. and you don't get educated, who's going to advocate for you and you can't advocate for yourself? I mean, it's just, uh, you know, unbelievable. It's not even, I, I can't even say that you'll be forgotten because people don't even know. Yes, yes. They didn't know about you in the first place. Yes, <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask you, um, you know, so you got out and, and they said, okay, you know, there wasn't enough evidence. And here you are like, 
oh my God, free at last. And then four months later, they say, oops. Uh, what that was, was that like? That was the uh, second bittersweet pill. It was like, it's yeah. two of them. It's, it's, Maybe you can get into a little bit, you know, getting the call from, you know, attorney you Michael Wiseman call, and what happened after that. I got a call that. from my lead attorney, Michael Wiseman, and uh, I'm at work. I was doing a flag at that time for Sam Mateo Construction, who I still work for now. Uh, he was crying during the call, so it was distorted. So I didn't know what he was talking about in the morning, but only thing I heard was your conviction has been reinstated. That's at the end of the call, like at the end of his sentence, I heard that. So I instantly got numb because I thought like maybe he said something wrong or I heard it wrong. Or then he went on to tell me what took place. You know, United States Supreme Court on May 29th, they made a decision per curium of reinstating my conviction without allowing my uh, legal team to file briefs or oral argue normal procedures all in one day. So I was numb. Like, that's any innocent person who got out of prison, their worst nightmare took place with me. Like, any is on the read. Yeah, that the courts would change their mind and you got to yeah. go back. That's the, that's the that's nightmare. That's the worst the nightmare. Innocent prison. Innocent, any innocent person, you ask them what's their worst nightmare, and they'll tell you if I got to go back, you know. And uh, I was numb. Like, I, I didn't have no feeling. I can imagine. you numb because you get flashes in your head what you went through. I, I did 16 and a half years. So everything is numb. Like, every, I got started all over again and as far as legal-wise because you can't argue the issues that you raised up, you know, that got you out. They're over now. The United States Supreme Court is the highest court. Now you got to go back downstairs and start all over again and try to mount up another defense, you know, mount up some new evidence that show that you're innocent. So it was, it was numb. To, I was numb. I was numb, you know, I had called the foundation, Jeff Foundation, and uh, told them what was going on. I had left work, drove down to the Jeffy Deficit Foundation, and I just went in the back office and by myself and just, you know, try to Process. gather my thoughts yeah. while the lawyers that was there was back and forth with the Pennsylvania lawyers trying to find out what's, what could be done, what happened, like, you know, where we go from here. And it was like, I, I started reaching out to a couple family members, letting them know what took place, but... I can't even tell you how I felt. I didn't have no feeling. I was numb. Like, and within uh, yeah. how much of it, how long did you have after he let you know to then show up? From May 29th to June 12th. Okay, so you have two weeks to process this and to decide whether you're going to bolt and exactly. run. Exactly. Let me just say this: that in, during that interview, during that intervening period. Uh, you know, Lorenzo and I made a number of moves. We tried on a political level. You know, I contacted a number of elected officials I knew. I brought Lorenzo with me up to Albany We, we were at, to participate in a press conference that I was doing in connection with the Innocence Project on, on wrongful conviction legislation. But I just threw him in front of the cameras, mm -hmm. you know, at, the, at their press conference. That I, you know, because we were desperate. We are trying to stop him from going back. But yeah. all the moves we made, it, it did, didn't work. Didn't Nobody work. was... Willing, willing to, uh, to, to, to do anything, and so in the end, we had to, we had to go on this uh, terrible car ride together. Yeah. You know, Lorenzo asked me, called me up, and one day, and he, you know, he asked me to do the most difficult thing I've ever had to do in my life. Um, uh, after being exonerated myself, he said, "Jeff, listen, I, I need you to drive me back to prison, man, because I got no one to take me, and otherwise, I'm gonna just be going on this lonely ride and Ugh. taking buses." Uh, you know, oh my God, and right. yeah, and so I wanted so bad yeah. to tell you no, <laughs> that I can't drive you back to prison or resume a life without parole sentence on a case yeah. you were innocent of. But I, I couldn't because I couldn't just have you on the buses. And so that ride was, oh my God, that ride was terrible there. It's like taking someone to, uh, you know, an execution. Yes. Right? In, in, yes. In, a way, in a way you look at it, it, it was very mentally... Like, how can I say it? Draining? Nah, that's the understatement. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> it is. you know, the show, the mind. It was like, it was, just think about it. You're leaving the confines of your family to voluntarily drive yourself back to a natural life sentence. No parole. Like, knowing you were innocent. Knowing you were Knowing innocent, that the system failed you already. Already. And now they're saying, oops. Go back. Go and, back and try again. You know, it was like, I wish it on no one. Like, you know, what I went through, like, that day of that drive going back was like, 
If you ask anybody, like you ask yourself, would you do that? You'd be like, I ain't not doing that. Like, I'm not, I'm going the other direction. Don't get me wrong. I had them thoughts. I entertained everything. And what had you not run? Hmm? What had you decide to go instead? Because of I was innocent, and I had a nice supporting cast around me, and I felt mm. that I had what it need. I had what was needed to win. Right. I didn't think that it was going to take this long. You know, I didn't think that certain things was going to turn out the way they turned out. But uh, the ride going back was like, it was surreal because it was like we both was playing different roles at different times. Half the time <laughs> I was telling him, look, Renz, it's going to be all right, bro. We, you know, we're going to get this, we're going to do, the yeah. investigation's going to take place. You know, we're going to turn this thing around four or five months. We'll be back in court, you know. And half the time I'm telling him that to comfort him. And, and then, then like five minutes yeah. later, he's telling the yeah. same thing to me because yeah. now I'm in this. So we're alternating roles. Yeah. And then... Uh, and then also it felt crazy what we were doing where it was rotating drivers. Yeah. And then on top of that, people are calling Lorenzo in and uh, up and like everybody is telling him, what are you nuts? You're going yeah. back where? What? You know, like turn that yes. car around and yeah. go in the opposite direction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he got a lot of calls like that. And then he's explaining half the people don't understand the legal context. So he's trying to educate them really, really quickly also. Yeah, it was, um, then we had the, the last, yeah, the, like our version of the Last Supper, right? Last the last meal. lunch, the last meal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just before he turned himself in, it was. Um, I don't think anyone was, can imagine it. You know, no. yeah. it's almost like, and this is a horrible thing to say, but it's like people heading to the concentration camps. Yes. You know, you know, yeah. you're getting on the train. Yeah. You have some hope that you might survive, but logic tells you you won't. You yes, won't. exactly. Yeah. You know, and for me, you know, when we're in the parking lot, uh, the prison. You know, I, I, I gave Lorenzo money to try to reset himself up back inside, stuff that he would need to help fight sure. the case. Ty, you know, the typewriter, mm. creature comfort stuff. You got to get his clothes and other stuff for postage and legal copies. And I'm like giving him, I don't know, maybe five, six hundred dollars And and I'm thinking, like, after I did that and he gets out the car and walks, I felt so inadequate. Like, mm. the money, that, that, not, what, yeah. that, what is that going to do yeah. for the overall situation, you know? Yeah. I drove the car out and I pulled over on the side of the road and it took me like 12 minutes just to get my emotions under control. I felt like I was like abandoning him in this awful looking building with a with the barbed wire yes. and, every, and it didn't crazy. help. They put the handcuffs on you. Yeah. You're outside the building. You're there and they got to put the handcuffs on to walk to take this. You, you know, come on. It, it was all it added to the. It added to the and trauma. And what's your feeling as you walk <coughs> through and those gates close behind you? It's different because I had to get myself in a mental place, you know, because when you're fighting a wrongful convictions, you don't have the luxury to entertain a lot of things. A lot of times you got to be emotional. It's just a lot of things because the time you're going to entertain that is going to be time away from your fight. So me, myself, I knew what I was up against. So... It was like how some fighters say, I got my game face on. You got to lock that mind state in. I'm coming here. I'm not coming here to be cordial with you. I'm coming here to sit until my time is up and get out of here. And when I say my time is up, I mean my legal team do what they got to do to prove my innocence. And I'm going to walk back out that door I came in. And that was that. Like, I, you know, walking back, they, they when I walked in the building, a couple of uh, guards was mad and then some was happy. So I never, you know, I didn't understand what was going on. Then it dawned on me, they had made bets, was I gonna show up? Or not. And some of them won, some of them lost. So I'm looking at it and it's sickening to me, like, you know, who does stuff like that in this type of situation? And when I'm walking back in. It's an inhuman act oh, yeah. in an inhuman environment. Yeah, so. I'm being put back in cages, the you know, clothes are being took and thrown away, you know. It I went I went on to say this, I went my brain spiraled for the first week or two. Like I went in a dark place, like, you know, I came in with the locked in mind state, but when you getting stuff you going from a five star restaurant, then you getting something slid under the door, slid through the door and you're not gonna have no appetite for that type of stuff. So I went to a dark place for like, you know, the first 10 days. Like, dark place, real dark. Like, don't want to talk, don't want to eat, you know. Trying to find out how did it all, this all happen. But when you're fighting against people who intentionally, maliciously prosecute you and they know you're innocent, it's like you have no luxury, you don't have no luxury to take a second off. 
You must fight, 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 fight. Because they're not going to just let you walk out the door. The other persons, they were making fun of you too, right? Some of them? That, that you even came back? Like, what, what are you doing back I would, here? You know, How would you say it? That would be the case, but me, myself, I don't have really a tolerance for that because you're not going to laugh in my face about me being in prison for something I ain't do. That won't sit kindly with me. So I, I, I wasn't the one that could hold my composure on that. But you have people that say, well, you're crazy. What are you doing back? You know, look what they did to him. Why would you come back? Well, look what they did to you. So that was taking place. I had people that I knew for 10, 15 years that I was real close with that me coming back to prison broke our friendship up because they was mad at me from coming back. And, and you could get that. You know, um, I, I'm going to make a request. Uh, we're almost out of time in this half hour that we continue this. We take a break and then we continue this because I want to hear more of your story and I think it's important for people to hear uh, more of your story and what people should be paying attention to. All right? All right. My name is Natasha Sherman. Thank you for joining us and please stay tuned for part two.